everybody. Um, so my name is uh, Johnny Johnson. I'm a consultant at Spectrop, specifically on the defensive team. Today, I really wanted to bring um, some research that I've been doing roughly about six months, um, if not a little longer than that, regarding logon sessions. <clears throat> Explicitly how defenders can use logon sessions today to help them from, a, especially from a Windows endpoint perspective, but as identity is growing, that could be used in cloud, et cetera, as well. Um, so a little, uh, little introduction about me, um, handle on everything is JSecurity 101. Don't judge me too much on that handle. I made that when I was in college. So um, I just kind of stuck over time. It's kind of a terrible handle, but oh well. Um, I'm a consultant at SpectreOps, uh, specifically on the defensive team. I like to focus on defensive research. Um, I really like to look at Windows internals and expose those for defenders and how they might be able to use that to the day-to-day -day operations and actually make those very practical to them. Previously, I was a senior threat researcher at uh, Red Canary, again, focused on um, Windows internals there. Um, I've done a lot of open source contributions, um, author stuff. So if you've ever heard of like the Red Canary atomic test harnesses, I've done a lot of things for there. Um, I have a lot of other stuff on my GitHub if you wanna go check it out. I also am one of two hosts of the Detection Challenging Paradigms podcast. Um, one of the cool things that a couple colleagues and I started up probably about a year and a half. I think we're hitting almost the two year mark. So that's uh, pretty cool. So um, let's go over like what's going to be talked about today. Um, the first is the why. So what actually brought me into looking at logon sessions? Um, and once I got there, what did I want to do with them? How did I scope that research, et cetera? And then let's talk about um, what are logon sessions. So it's important for us as defenders, if we're going to rely on any type of telemetry, we have to understand how is it exposed to us and if we can and cannot rely on it um, when it is exposed to us in that telemetry. And then also understand our vendors, if they're exposing it to us in the right ways or the, the wrong fashion. I'm gonna go over some like actual practical um, defensive capabilities um, and also the available telemetry exposed to us today. And also some of the issues with telemetry and what might not be exposed to us. Um, and then actually come, I have some test cases, so some practical examples um, going through some actual alerts that I triggered and then moving forward that way. So taking everything from a very ground up, so research, looking at it, understanding the internals, and then making it practical for defenders today. <laughs> and then um, I actually upda created slash updated a PowerShell script that can be used for investigation purposes, and I'll, I'll talk about that here shortly. Great. So the why. What brought me there? So about a year, year and a half ago, I was really interested in something called access tokens. And we'll talk about access tokens here shortly because um, it'll, it'll come in context. Um, but while going through that, I asked myself when looking at like the different structures, um, what are some of the available telemetry through that's exposed through telemetry through that? One of the things were logon sessions and logon IDs. And so after pivoting and like scoping that research, I've kinda, I kind of went into that avenue. And then once I got to that point, I asked myself, um, how are vendors exposing this? Um, once I kind of went through the internal process and understand like, okay, within Windows internals, when is a logon session created? And we'll talk about that here in a moment. What are logon IDs? Um, how often are logon sessions created? Um, and then if they could be useful. Um, I, the majority of what I'll talk about today is gonna to be from a more investigation standpoint. Um, however, there are some great detection standpoints and that's simply only because of the limitation of telemetry today. But as that grows, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll look at that. Another reason why I want to look at this is because today inside of investigations, oftentimes um, everything is very process centric. And what I mean by that is whenever an alert fires, an analyst is going to go to that box and go to that timeline and, and they're going to look at that user and look at that, like that parent to child to grandchild process, the whole process tree. The issue is what happens if there is something else malicious in a different process tree that that pivot is somewhat difficult. Um, or like, like, let's look at an example of that. So like say if someone process injects or create a service that technically that service was created within that logon session timeline. And we'll talk about that, but you wouldn't see that from a process uh, creation standpoint. And so there was some limitations in that aspect. Now um, there's also a piece um, whenever you're doing the process, uh, the, the uh, parent to uh, child to grandchild process, that's very time consuming um, because an analyst can get very much lost inside the data and then either not know how to scope it or not know how to pivot into 
other malicious, potential malicious activity. Um, and so there's potentially lost activity there. Um, and so the goal here is to somewhat walk through and uh, maybe find a better scope that investigators can at least start with. Cool, so the first piece is to talk about logon sessions. Um, we're gonna kind of dive into this a little bit and uh, not get too in depth in the internals, but it's important for us to know at least a little bit. Um, within logon processes, there's, um, there's really three main components. The first part, uh, like part is gonna be the logon session initialization. That's gonna be a user wants access um, to a computer. Now, anytime anybody wants or any user wants access to a resource, they have to access that computer. Hence, they have to log into that host as well. So that's gonna be the, initial, the initialization process. Um, and this could be remotely, but this is just anytime a user just wants to, hey, I wanna um, give you my creds, please log me in. Then you have the actual authentication piece. And that's whenever the authentication package and security support provider goes through the, the protocol that it needs to to actually successfully log in that user. And then you have the origin token creation. After every time a logon session is created, um, a origin token, as they call it, or origina originating token, is created to start the first process off, um, or at least give the context for the, the correct process. Now, for this talk, we're actually going to be talking about the last two pieces. I don't really care about how the um, initialization happened. Um, this can happen so many different ways, so many different variables, but this research is going to be explicitly on that, those, those last two pieces. So um, if you're not familiar, logon sessions, um, these are sessions that are created upon a user's logon, successful logon, okay? Um, that, this is literally the one of the last pieces within the authentication um, protocol um, process. And whenever that user terminates their logon, that logon session is taken away, it's, it's destroyed. Um, it's referenced via something called a logon ID. So there's, inside of Windows, there's something called a LUID structure. Um, and so, the lower part of that is what's going to actually represent that logon session. It's called a logon ID. And we'll, we'll touch on that and we'll mention that here in a second. Um, there's also a really cool aspect where depending on the user and their privileges on that machine, if you put in your credentials one time, you might think to yourself, cool, I'm only logging in one time. There's actually two logon sessions that actually happen there. Um, so say I'm a user, I'm a local admin on a host and I log in. Well, what's gonna happen is you're gonna have a medium integrity level logon. And so that's gonna be your typical everyday activity. I'm gonna open up PowerPoint, I'll look at files, et cetera. As soon as you click on um, uh, run as administrator, the UAC elevation is going to kick in. And what that is, is that's gonna say, hey, I wanna use my high integrity level token, which was logged on the exact same time or represents the logon session that was logged on the exact same time as your medium level token. Okay, and then your context is going to switch into that. Okay, so everything you do is gonna be ran under that logon session and everything you do that's not privileged is gonna run under your medium. And I'll show, I'll show an image of that here in a moment. Um, that's important because there's actually some, there is linking within the operating system that says, hey, this is the split token or this is my buddy logon ID. And so whenever I want to elevate, this is the logon session I'm going to be using. Um, here's an example of that. <clears throat> here we see a 4624 event um, and we see two different logons. So you'll see the linked logon and the logon, both of which are both have a hex value. Um, so that hex value is going to be a 32-bit value that, that is the low part of that Lewis structure we mentioned. Um, if we look on the right, this is an awesome tool by um, James Forshaw called um, NT Object Manager. Simply all I'm doing there is I'm getting access to my current token and um, that's running under two different contexts. And I'm, and I'm um, showing something called the authentication ID which is one of the places that logon IDs are referenced within the token structure. We'll mention that, but we're, let's not get into that too much yet. Cool, so let's dive into access tokens. Um, if you're not familiar um, from a higher level, access tokens are simply just securable objects that serve to identify the security context of a process and threat. So what that means is you um, act as anything that happens on the Windows operating system happens in the context of a thread, because that's what's gonna be executing. The process is gonna be that container. So the um the token is meant to serve to say hey this is this user who's a part of these groups and have these privileges and by the way this is its valid logon session and here's the logon id that's tied to that so that gives the process everything it needs so whenever you want access to a resource that access token actually gets checked 
and validates whether or not you actually should get access to that um, resource or not. Um, <clears throat> this is represented in the kernel via something called the token structure. Um, <clears throat> and then there's one created, there's originating token created um, at the end of every successful logon, as I mentioned earlier. So there's one, there's one initiating process or one initiating a token per, per, uh, per logon. So here is uh, what the logon session looks like inside of the token structure. So um, this is simply just a printout of the token structure within the kernel of Windows. Um, within that, there is the authentication ID. This, as you see here, it's a pointer to a Lewid structure. If you go look at that Lewid structure, um, it is going to be the logon, the low part of that logon ID. <laughs> um, and then there's also another piece um, within the logon session. Um, that's a pointer to something called the set logon session references which simply is just a structure that references the logon session. And if you go look at that, you'll actually will see the logon ID and you'll actually will see the buddy logon ID, which is quite helpful as well. Great, so this is going to be the, um, the logon process. Again, from a very high level, but it's important for us to understand this. So um, the first step is a logon is requested and a user's credentials are exposed. So I say, hey, here are my credentials, please authenticate me. Um, step two is authentication package takes those credentials and authenticates the user. So there's a lot involved within step two there, um, a lot, a lot involved, but that's just a high level. Number three is the authentication package creates a logon session and gives it to LSA, so L the LSAS process. Funny enough, this all is actually done within the LSAS process um, from the authentication perspective, but there's different services involved. So step four is a token, potentially more than one, um, is created for that user. Again, if there is a high integrity level process, um, and it needs a logon session for that, it'll go through and actually generate that split token for it and that split logon session. And then um, step five is the logon session is referenced within the token structure via members. And so the authentication ID as we saw earlier, and then also the step logon session references. All right, cool. So now that we know that, let's, um, let's, take, a, let's take a picture and an image of what potentially could be the problem today from a um, investigation perspective, if I want to look at this activity here. Okay, so as we see here, um, there's one user logged in, there's two logon sessions that were created. One is the high integrity level um, context. Um, there's simple processes like PowerPoint, Notepad, et cetera. I really, I really don't know if a hacker can call himself a hacker if Notepad or CMD is not created. So I may have to make sure I put that in the image. Um, and then we saw CMD, we see a PowerShell encoded command. Um, we see a beacon being dropped, and then we see a run as. Now, this is important because this is where context switch happens. Okay, so there's a run as, and another user is logged on, and then there is a, excuse me, there is a process created, CMD, and then PS exec. Um, I use PS exec because that seems to be a good. A lot of people love PS exec, so here would be a good example. So, from an investigation perspective, what would happen? Okay, say if I have um, theoretically an alert that comes in for PS exec, what I would have to do is I'd have to go inside that alert, depending on if it's a custom alert or if it's something that's exposed to the vendor, it doesn't matter. So it depends on like, there's a lot of variables here. So it depends what attributes or metadata is exposed to me. But theoretically, if we go look at that, then we would see that the parent might be CMD, right? And we would see that that might come from run as, and then like there might be, depending on the data, we could maybe follow that process up. However, um, that's if we follow the process ID appropriately. The problem is process IDs are not unique enough and there could be replication. And so like there could be mismatch of data of what we're seeing. And if we're doing an analysis, we could be seeing there's multiple parents to a specific process ID. So then we have to do time, then we have to do user. And there's a whole bunch of things that, that come and play with that. Because if you look at the users explicitly, then we wouldn't see anything past the, uh, the run as, right? We would see the user logged in, a CMD and the PS exec, but if there's issues that way. Um, what if I told you though, that there is a way for the investigator to actually scope that whole thing and see all this data um, and not have to actually do as much pivoting in terms of telemetry context. That's where the logon session um, is going to come in. And so I call this kind of the logon session centric data. It is, its purpose is meant to actually expose processes um, that are given or executed within a specific logon session, um, but you would actually be able to see this whole tree flow here. Um, you would have to mix match data like with one of security events, 
an EDR vendor and back and forth. But nonetheless, all that is exposed to you through the logon session. And then you would actually be able to start from PS exec and see everything back from CMD for the high and theory level to context. And then there are ways to make to find what the uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the buddy logon ID is and see everything on that end too. But that saves time. It saves time and it's also accurate. So like now from an investigation perspective, you look at that and you say, great, I can scope this. And whenever I want to go do some hunting and figure out if there's anything else bad there, I can do so, but I've saved so much time within that process that um, I'm not wasting it. I'm not going through like an out and analysis paralysis and all these different things. And so like the data is very clear and cut. And the big piece was when I was doing this research, I wanted to make sure this wasn't just research telemetry. There's a big problem. Um, oftentimes that uh, like, for example, we take ETW events, right? Let's just take an example. ETW events, um, it is exposed through us and a lot of vendors and a lot of capabilities, but there's no practical way today to pick up any ETW event that I want on every host inside my environment, log that and expose that, right? So I consider ETW to an extent to be very much research telemetry. The, now there are ways obviously that vendors can collect that, but you have no control of that as the end user, right? One big thing was when I was looking at this, I wanted this to turn this from research telemetry, research telemetry to practical telemetry. Um, meaning I wanted it to be practical. So what I did was I actually tested this out in many investigations. Now I've never, like I never did this inside of an IR operation. It was more of like, Hey, we see something suspicious or malicious, or you know, a couple of weeks ago I did a I did a compromise assessment. And so I used this methodology multiple times and it very much helped me pinpoint what I thought potentially what could have been bad, and then helped me make those decisions slightly quicker, and then also help me identify what I need to pivot to next in order to help make those uh, to make those decisions. So the defensive capabilities. Um, there is practicality in terms of a detection um, thing. I hope everybody likes that gift, by the way. So fun fact, I did a, let me just look back. So I have this thing, um, I did a talk with Olaf Hartong a while back and I had a lightsaber one with a cat and that was hilarious. And so I was like, you know, it'd be funny is if I could find another good, funny lightsaber one. And somehow I came across this and I was like, this is too good to be true. So I had to use that. So I, I heard some chuckles. So I hope people appreciated that. Um, there is some practicality in um, leveraging logon session centric data and from a detection perspective. And we'll talk about that. It's like the last couple of slides, but it's not as much from it as it would be from an investigation perspective. Um, there is a way to do joins in, in the sense of like, I want to see if someone accessed um, or created a scheduled task and they had a network three type logon, a network logon that you can do that. And you can do that within a detection. And I've done that multiple times and it, it's helpful. Um, but it, there is somewhat, I put an example there. There's actually supposed to be an example, but then I realized I put it on the last slide. So my bad. I actually sent uh, Jennifer two different uh, PowerPoints. One has actual on it and the other one was just regular. And I meant to update that on the actual, but I didn't. So my bad. The example is later on the slides. Um, but really the practicality really comes from an investigation perspective. I've talked about this couple, like a little bit, but this is more scoped approach. Um, it allows me to, and I'll show these examples, but allows me to look at an alert, take that login ID, run a query, and at least whatever that vendor is exposing to me in terms of actions, it allows me to look at what all those are. And so whenever I'm initially performing that investigation, and I, I think like a typical question is, what else did this user perform, right? Like that's a typical question that's asked. This is an easy way to scope that. Um, and so I'll show a query and I'll show like the investigation. Um, and there are some gaps um, that are exposed through like the login ID fields. Um, and I'll talk about that. I think it's in two slides. Great, so there is um, a lot of good available telemetry today. So if you're ingesting Windows security events, the, the high majority of um, uh, Windows security events are actually leveraging um, login IDs. And I did some work, uh, I think it was like two days ago. Um, I did some reversing on trying to figure out how they're pulling the login IDs. And um, it's pretty standard on how Windows security events are doing that. So you can rely on that pretty heavily. There are a couple of events that don't expose it. And um, maybe we can get those exposed somehow if there's more visibility into this. Sysmon only does it through the process, uh, the, the process creation events. Sysmon is actually unique as it exposes a logon GUID value, which is a mixture between the logon ID and like the um, machine hash and like timestamp and all these other things, um, <clears throat> which is actually quite useful as well. 
because one thing that's difficult is the logon ID is it is like I mentioned earlier, it's um, a LUID structure. The L in that means local. So it's a local unique identifier, meaning that potentially that value could be replicated. Um, so if you have a large org and you're seeing one logon ID on one host and another one from another host, that's, that's the reason. But if you see things like GUID, that's globally unique. So you shouldn't see any of those replications. So if you're ingesting system on events, the GUID values are, are phenomenal to leverage. Um, Microsoft Defender for Endpoint um, actually has a lot of good 48 plus different action types containing the logon ID. This is only the, the action types that are exposed to me um, on my own personal MDE instance as we're in a research lab. So if there, there could be potentially more. Um, there are other uh, EDR vendors. It's actually quite common for vendors to expose this. I've seen this with, um, well, really every EDR vendor except one. I'm not going to name it, but um, every, everybody else is pretty much on pace with that. Now, moving forward, I'm going to be using MDE for an example. The reason being is the language is really easy to read, and I'm going to do some type of analysis here. And with that analysis, um, I was going to do everything like suck everything up into like a Jupyter notebook. Um, I saw Roberto using one earlier. I just didn't know how to represent that well because there would be, have to be some massaging of the data to get everything working well. So I did everything inside of Kusto, inside of MDE, but it is possible to do it um, with Windows Security Events mixed with MDE and Sysmon. I've done it within Sentinel and I've done it within Jupyter. So it is possible. So if you're, if you're curious, if you have that type of pipeline inside your organization, it's very, it's very possible I've done it. Cool. So um, like I mentioned, MDE is a great ask, uh, great asset when it comes to exposing this data. Um, here is just an example of some of the action types that are exposed to us. So you have like logon success, you have process created, um, you have LDAP searches, <clears throat> excuse me, you have service installed. That's pretty sick. I'll show you that in here a little bit. Um, you'll have like create mode thread API. Um, here's more examples and more examples. So these are all that are just exposed to me like three or four days ago. Um, in like a 24 hour period. And so there's potentially more that could be there. Um, and I think um, it seems like, if I'm not mistaken, it seems like a very, to be a very good push within MDE. Um, I'm not marketing for them, but I have seen over time, the login ID field be exposed more and more and more through MDE, which is pretty cool. Cool. So um, there is one limitation. I want to point this out since I am using MDE. I have to talk about one little limitation I have. Um, so say if you do a um, run as net only, this is very common if you've heard of like Cobalt Strike and Beacon, and it wants access to a remote resource, um, it'll run like the run as net only. And it'll do like, an, it'll do a new credential logon. Um, and this simply means that the credentials are not checked on the local machine, but it's checked on the target machine. Um, so that authentication happens on the target. Um, you will see a, you will see a uh, logon on the local machine, um, and you actually will see something called the network account name. Um, and this simply is just the account name that's going to be used for network resources um, whenever it's accessed. Okay. However, with NBDE, that's not exposed. Um, so if you see new credential in the device logon events, um, you would see in this particular instance, I should also point out that everything's going to be Marvel related. I'm a big Marvel fan, so the whole lab's Marvel, Marvelized. So um, that's kind of funny, Marvelized, Marvelous. Uh -huh. Anyways, I just thought of that. Um, moving on. So inside of MDE, that's not exposed. And so that is a limitation. So you'll see like new credential logons, and you're like, oh, cool. What was that net-only event that they maybe, uh, or the net-only user they're using for network um, accounts? You're not going to see that. So that would be a situation where you would want to rely on 4624s. And that's important just from a defensive standpoint is, not only relying maybe on one vendor all the time for all collection and all alerting, you do want to mix match. And so there is a lot of things that's exposed through MDE, um, but Windows security events might be better and vice versa. Cool. So now we're going to move into the practical examples. Um, this is where I really think the logon session research shines. And I wanted to get here as quick as possible because I could talk all day about like the Windows internals. Anybody ever wants to nerd out about how that's done under the hood? Yo, I'm happy to nerd out. But I think it's, it's important um, to showcase how the research is practical to us today. Um, and so let's look at that. All right, so here um, I have a, an alert, <clears throat> a credential dumping alert. 
Um, this is a uh, very, so let me just give the background here. So in this particular instance, I, I dropped a, a cobalt strike beacon um, and then I just dumped LSAS via Mimikatz, um, log, on, log on passwords command. Um, and then I created a service. So um, that being said, so here we see a, um, an alert pop up for that. And this is actually a, um, this is a default alert within MD. So I wanted to show this because this actually this is actually exposed already to us. Um, oh, I actually pressed the wrong button. Back, go back. Okay, cool. Here we go. So if we look at the very bottom here, we'll see user and we'll see logon ID. So that logon ID is exposed to us in the alert. So if I just snatch that up and I run it inside this next query, what's interesting is I will see the activity um, where the dumping LSAS was happened. So the open process API call was done to LSAS, um, and then I will also see the service was in, another service was installed all through the um, logon ID, logon, uh, logon ID. So this is super cool. You also see different things. So like, um, what if there was a situation, like in this situation, I wasn't alerted on like DLL host running anything. And as those who know, like Cobalt Strike leverages DLL host quite a bit to run commands. Um, and we see that activity here as well, which is super cool. Um, what do you want to point out? So the logon ID 999, that's going to be uh, system. Um, and this is what I was talking about, how the Lewid structure is local unique. Every time um, system is exposed from a logon ID perspective, it'll always be 999. Um, that's because the system, excuse me, the system um, uh, logon is always going to have the same logon ID. Um, and MDE exposes logon IDs via the, uh, the integer value, not um, the hacks as we saw at one of the security events which is why I was saying there might have to be some massaging of data whenever you're actually pu pushing it through your pipeline. So if you want it in like the integer value, you could do that. If you want it in hex, you could convert it. And within this as well, as you see here, so the kind of command, I'll kind of walk through it. So what I'm doing is I'm looking at um, device process events and I'm looking at device events and I'm going ahead and doing some like parsing from like action types that I know should exist within that. And in this, I'm just, um, um, exposing um, the service name, if there are any name pipes, exposing that. Um, and then also the desired access, if something, if access was desired and granted to a, to a resource. Great, so I also just realized like five minutes for this presentation, I misspelled escalation. Um, when I upload the slides, it'll be proper. Um, I don't have an excuse for that. I grew up in the Midwest, I grew up in Missouri. So, Spelling was not the number one thing we focused on. So take that as it may. All right, cool. Um, so here we see another default MDE alert. Um, again, so if we look at this alert, it gives a lot of cool context. It kind of shows us that process tree. If we go look at that user, we'll see that login ID. Great, so now that I have that, I can then go run a very similar query to what I had previously. Um, the cool thing about this is I not only see the injection attempts, but I also see that there's a scheduled task that was created, um, which I was not alerted on previously, right? So now I'm like, when I'm looking at this event, I'm like, cool, um, there was some like privilege escalation attempts. So it looks like it was injection based, um, but I didn't know there was a scheduled task created in my organizations. From an investigation perspective, that's probably what I'm gonna go look at next. The really cool thing is, is the last presentation was talking about RDP um, logons. This was actually, if you look, this was a logon type remote interactive. So someone, Panther, um, by the way, from Marvel, um, logged in via RDP remote interactive onto this host. They um, create a scheduled task and then they inject it, right? So now we see all that and we see like the whole kind of timeline view here of what happened and was exposed to us. Great. Let's look at another one, lateral movement. Lateral movement's really cool. Um, and so I really wanna focus on like credential dumping, pros escalation um, and lateral movement. And I believe I have a persistence one as well. So um, this is an ongoing on hands keyboard attacker. Basically it's a cobalt, it's a cobalt strike alert. Okay, default by MDE once again. Um, and inside of here, we can see um, that activity. Inside here, it looks like there is some type of um, PowerShell thing going on. Um, and I can take that logon ID and so let's plug this in. And at the very top here, um, we see those processes running. Um, and those are very indicative of WinRM. When someone logs into your box via WinRM and they want to, they want to execute something via code, 
this is this is how they that's what that kind of looks like great so let's let's take that context um we're going to then run that inside of a query and what's cool about this is we we see um a lot of cool different activity we see that there was a network type logon right um and i'll talk about that here in a moment um and then we see the winrm the embedding that that embedding command there um, which is indicative of winrm and then we see some type of powershellism that was created um again indicative of winrm and then we see another process was created cool so we take that um and we can again i want to talk about the network stuff and then the question is if this was a lateral movement to a remote host how do i take this to the source host how do i see who actually did that activity well <clears throat> if we take that and we look at the device network events um because if we had an if we have a logon then that there's some type of network event that had to have happened right so let's go look at device network events let's go look at the ip that was exposed via if we go back here if we look here we can actually expose the port and the remote ip through the logon um successful logon event um we take that we plug it in here i'm doing a join on process based events and sure enough on asgard the host i see some type of encoded powershell command cool um i want to take that then and see if there's anything i can relate now this is a limitation device network events do not have a logon session id or logon id tag filled with it so I have to, this is where you might have to go do some digging and more analysis. And again, this, this is not the perfect process yet, but maybe as more time it's exposed to this, we can leverage it more and um, vendors will expose more. But imagine if the device events had a login ID that would make, take this process completely out um, and there'd be less digging, but we have to do this. There was another, um, there was another alert that popped up called suspicious process execution PowerShell command. I get the login ID through that though. And so then I'm on that, I'm on the source host and I can take that and I can, I can look at, look it up and I can see that there was a CMD um, um, from a DLL host. Again, as we talk about DLL host, Cobalt Strike's very popular with running commands through a DLL host. Great. So um, we, if we take that back, I meant to show one more thing here. We can take that back and we can actually find the source origin command that was ran to actually run the lateral movement attempt. Great. So from this perspective, we see the source. And from the previous couple of slides, we saw the server side, um, meaning we had one user trying to log into another to do lateral movement. Great. And now, now we see that full context. If the device network events had a login ID, this would be slightly easier. And this is where that PowerShell script will come in in a couple of slides. Cool. From a detection perspective, I was talking to um, a colleague of mine, Jared Atkinson, and um, I was telling him the kind of like the struggles with logon IDs and logon sessions and how we could use that. Because as we go through, you know, the detection realm is very big on identity today. Okay. It's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. But one of the things I think identity strives in is from a contextual standpoint, um, not a primary data perspective. And what I mean by that is, if I want to see all the actions that someone done, did inside of my host or whatever that may be, I can leverage identity to help me like tag all those in the timeline together. Except identity isn't great, except in a couple use cases to be the primary data source for um, detection. And he mentioned to me, have you ever looked into, cause I've talked about like different logons. So you might have like remote interactive, new credentials, things like that. Um, and those are helpful because new credentials is relatively uncommon as long as your admins are not running run as. I hope admins are not running run as. Um, and things like that. And he mentioned to me, have you ever looked at um, the uh, device logon events and looked at network and wherever that network logon happened, where there was a process spawned afterwards? And I was like, no, I, you know, I never actually thought about that. Why? And he said, because oftentimes, um, it's typical for, it's common for device, uh, for logon events to happen with a network logon type, but it's uncommon if there's a process spawn afterwards and that's indicative of lateral movement. And I was like, oh, let me check that out. Sure enough, I ran this um, within a 30 day period. All that's my like, that's my whole test range. And I actually, my MDE, my current MDE, MDE is connected to every host within my house, which is probably about 10 to 11. Um, and it only showed the two that I ever run attacks on. 
And so I was like, oh, that's cool. So I actually dug into that and I confirmed that, that that finding from him was correct. So if Jared sees that, thanks for that, man. That was, that was really cool to see. Cool. Um, as I mentioned, um, there is a issue with device network events not exposing log, uh, log IDs. Why is that an issue? Lateral movement is common. Um, and if I don't get to see that login ID that actually, that actually tried to make that network connection, it's hard to know that network connection happened unless I leverage like the process ID or the, or the previous kind of process centric approach of user, time, host, et cetera, right? So I mentioned to, funny enough, Jared a long time ago that I wanted to create a script that basically from an investigation perspective, if I found an alert with a login ID, uh, I wanted to run a PowerShell script to show me um, every process that was running under that login ID. And then I was going to like bake in some type of way to see network events as well. And he let me know that there was another colleague of ours, Lee Christensen, that actually did that a couple years ago. Um, except he only did it from a process perspective, not the network, not the network perspective. Um, and so I was like, oh, that's interesting. So this is the last talk also, phenomenal talk, talked about like, you don't always have to recreate the wheel. You can just take your thoughts and your methodology and apply it to a new, an older tool and just elevate the tool. And that's what I did here. So what I did was I created a PowerShell script that allowed me to um, pull a login ID and get, the, um, and get the processes that were tied to it, um, but also get the network events. Uh, in here, there's two tags. There is the include, um, include linked. And so what that is, I'm doing some code behind the scenes from a token perspective to actually identify what the, the buddy login ID is. And I'm actually pulling events for that as well. Um, so that just a little code underneath the hood. How am I pulling the network events? The network events are being pulled via ETW actually. So the script runs for about 60 seconds. You can change that time. Um, and what that'll do is it'll take that link. It'll take the login ID. It'll get all the processes, and then it'll do a ETW network capture, massage all that data, try to find if there's any like processes that are correlated with that, and then validate that those are there. Here, as you can see, I did just that, and uh, DLL host is running um, some type of network event back to those sources. Um, here's another example of that, and with Panther, and I just thought it would be kind of cool to do that through since I are. Um, and so here's an example of running it through since IR. If you leverage since IR from an investigation perspective today, since I was using MDE for everything. Um, so as we conclude, there's a couple things. When looking at re when looking at telemetry from a research perspective, it's, it's very important to find the practicality or the operational piece of it. And if it's not practical or it's not operational today, try to find a way to make it that way. Whether that's through your connections with your EDR vendor. Or that's, not, or that's creating a script or adding information to a script. All those are possibilities for us as defenders today. Um, the login session centric analysis methodology is not meant to replace previous methodologies. It's meant to add to it and elevate them. And so as you saw with the login session stuff, I was still looking at processes, but I was looking at it from a different angle. And the different angle exposed um, different contexts would help me make decisions quicker and more accurately from an investigation perspective and also from a detection perspective. Um, there's still some limitations today from a telemetry perspective. There are some action types within MDE. There are some events within Windows Security Events. And there are some vendors that are not actually collecting login IDs within their events. Um, I hope for that to change. Um, and again, if one, isn't, if one telemetry is not exposing that um, capability, the possibility or the odds that another one is, is, is quite high. So every time I found that like MDE wasn't exposing something to me, Windows security events did, all except for that, uh, the network piece there. Um, and here's the resources. If you ever wanna learn more about login sessions, the Windows internals book, I think everybody should learn that uh, or read that, it's phenomenal. Um, Microsoft documentation. And then if you wanna look at that logon processes uh, PS1, that is the GitHub and I'll put this all on Twitter later. Um, so there's a quick and easy way to get to it. Thank you.